I'm Grant Hogue from Boston Children's Hospital, uh, alongside my co-host, uh, Dr. John Voorhees from Stanford. And this is the newest episode of the Scoliosis Dialogues, the official podcast of the Scoliosis Research Society. I want to start off by reminding everyone that abstract submissions for our annual meeting in 2024 are currently open and will remain open through February 1st, 2024. So you've got a lot of time. Go ahead and get your projects and your abstracts started now. Uh, we have a bit of excitement for our meeting today because we have the award winner for best basic science research paper, the Russell A. Hibbs Award. And this is Pat Cahill from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, and he won this award for his work entitled The Hierarchic Evaluation of Mechanically Induced Growth Modulation of the Spine in a Growing Pig Model. Uh, so welcome, Pat, and thanks for being alongside, John. Yeah, th thanks, Grant. Uh, really happy to be here and honored to be here. Uh, and so, Pat, I, I kind of just want to get us started off. Can you maybe just give some background on you personally and professionally? It's a big deal to win an award like this. It doesn't happen overnight. So how did you get to this point? What does the path look like? Um, yeah, I, I, that's a great question. So I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon, uh, but I work exclusively at a children's hospital. So that's a little bit unique because most people that do spine surgery on kids are pediatric orthopedic surgeons. Uh, or at least most people that do only spine surgery on kids are pediatric orthopedic surgeons. I'm one of the rare ones that went about it from the spine standpoint. Uh, but I've been in, interested in research for a long time. I've had some really great mentors and people like Howard on Tony Ranella, who've inspired me and led me in those ways. Uh, this particular project, I owe a lot of credit to um, my senior partners at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where I've been for the last eight years, uh, and I owe credit to Jack Flynn and Bob Campbell. Um, so they, I was lucky enough to join them after spending seven or eight years in practice at the uh, Shriners Hospital in Philadelphia, where I also kind of started to learn uh, how to be a clinical scientist. Um, but at CHOP, there was a lot of great resources to uh, tap into the University of Pennsylvania uh, community of great scientists and um, also um, have streams of funding to support uh, uh, projects and research areas. So um, CHOP has a program called the Frontier Program that supports um, centers of excellence that do things that are unique and um, uh, kind of set CHOP apart from other places. And so Bob Campbell was able to get that support for his thoracic insufficiency program. And then um, after Bob's passing, uh, we have tried to carry on that tradition. Um, and then this particular project uh, came about um, uh, through a lot of twists and turns and collaborations with really smart people, including Tom Scher at the Veterinary Hospital, uh, Grant, your partner, Brian Snyder, played a huge role in the success of our um, translational research program and, and this program in particular. And he's somebody who I, I look up to as a mentor and who kind of coached me in how to uh, get these types of projects off the ground and going. So um, a lot of a lot of great things fell into place and and hopefully we were in the right place at the right time to kind of make those things uh, happen. So thanks. So this yeah, is an animal really model. Can, I, I wanted to ask a little bit about sort of how you got into to, to working in, in animal models. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot of people yeah. with, with zany ideas every once in a while. And, uh, you know, it's not part of standard uh, orthopedic or neurosurgery training as to, to how to go about doing an animal model uh, study. So how did you how did you get into that? Yeah, so a couple of ways. So we were interested in studying an animal model uh, and Brian Snyder at Boston Children's had an animal model in rabbits for thoracic insufficiency syndrome and uh, looking at what happens when the thorax is constricted uh, because of deformity and uh, how that can be reversed with uh, surgical intervention. Uh, we tried to bring that to CHOP and ultimately had to partner with the veterinary school with Tom Scher, who's a uh, veterinary orthopedist, um, and we found that uh, we we're going to have better success trying that model in pigs than in rabbits. And so we started doing some of that in pigs and we continue to do some of that work. But then we also um, saw that uh, tether was taking off and there was a lot of interest in uh, usage of tether. And there wasn't a lot of great science to to say what exactly was happening to the spine. And we wanted to know 
if people are claiming to have growth modulation of the spine, we wanted to actually show that that was something that was feasible, that you could apply uh, tension on one side of the spine and have differential rates of growth between the, the tension side and the, the side that was not under tension. Um, and we felt that uh, a pig model was, was probably going to be the best way to do it. We started with an anterior model um, and kind of struck out. The pigs were too strong and pulling out screws and stuff. And then we said, all right, maybe a posterior model. And then um, it evolved from there. We, we tried a couple different designs and ultimately selected the flexible titanium cable as the, the construct that could impart tension. Uh, we were interested in, in answering some of the questions that we already have answered in the extremities, such as for how long and under how much tension do you have to place a growth plate to get X degrees of correction of deformity. Um, and so we wanted to have an implant that had some features like a strain gauge that can give us feedback on the deformity or a spring loaded uh, tension application where we could measure the length of the spring and then know how much tension the construct was under. So was, was this device that you created really designed as a tool to better understand how compression mediates or affects growth modulation? Or is it uh, something that you thought might be a stepping stone to an implant that could be used to correct scoliosis in the future? No, we first started as just trying to, to do uh, growth modulation of the, of the pig spine. And then when we realized it was working so well, we said, wait a minute, this might have applications for early onset scoliosis and pediatric deformity. Um, so that's what led to the patent. And also some of the unique aspects of it, such as having strain gauges and Bluetooth uh, technologies, I think were really um, unique and useful in that sense. And so Pat, you've kind of helped us cover like the impetus for this in a little yeah. bit of the methodology and how you've done it. And so, I, you know, not to bury the lead, but what did you find? What happened? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, well, first of all, we were, we created deformity, which was first, which was the, the first goal is that we could show that by imparting tension, we could make the spine grow asymmetrically and lead to a, a curvature in the spine. And that curvature looks like scoliosis. It's, it's curved in the coronal plane, but there's also an axial plane component. And then we did this analysis of kind of looking from the gross to the microscopic at what those changes actually look like. So we have a Cobb angle and we could see that with time that Cobb angle was increasing, uh, which is reassuring. And then we got some advanced imaging along the way and we showed that, uh, that it, initially the deformity was happening in the disc, that there was some wedging of the disc. And that wedging kind of got to a certain point and stayed there the whole time. Uh, but then what was changing with time after, you know, after the initial change with the disc, then the change started to happen in the vertebral bodies. And we saw wedge shaped vertebral bodies, uh, which look a lot like what we see in our patients with scoliosis, which so that was really uh, encouraging. Um, then we started to look at uh, and partner with um, Dawn Elliott, who's one of the world leading disc biologists. Um, and she does most of her work on degenerative discs, but she was able to show us what was happening um, imaging wise within the disc. And essentially, it looks like uh, we are creating a model of degeneration. So initially we were uh, at the very earliest time points under tension, there was decreased molecular and nutritional transport across the end plates. Uh, and then eventually this led to a degenerative type pattern in the disc, um, where on the concavity, we saw a loss of architecture of the um, uh, annulus. Uh, we saw decreased uh, cellularity and uh, um, matrix health in the nucleus and even at the end plate started to get more um, uh, thickened and arthritic looking on the concavity so um, and that and some of that was from imaging and some of that was from microscopic analyses um, but all in all it, it, it was a consistent picture that um, it maybe that is the mechanism that we're not understanding with scoliosis is that we're causing asymmetrical degeneration or maybe this is just what we're showing in our model but potentially also creating with vertebral tether and maybe this is different than what's actually happening in scoliosis. Those are, that's the, the big next question, I think. But um, either way, we showed that we have a deformity. We showed that under tension, the disc seems to be degenerative, particularly on the concavity. Interestingly, at the apical levels, we also showed that the, the growth plate is separating and kind of pulling apart, sort of like a Salter-Harris-1 type fracture. 
uh, on the convexity as well. So, so it's not just the um, tension side or not just the tether side that's having some problems, but also on the um, convexity as well. Um, so yeah, so it's pretty exciting. So we could create scoliosis. We're starting to get data on how much force and quantify how much force is required to have how many degrees per level per month in these animals. Um, and now we know uh, what these pictures look like. So we're going to try to do more. Uh, next steps are to do things like uh, complex immunohistochemistry staining to see which aspects of degeneration and, and loss of collagen uh, uh, fiber signals and things like that are being affected and seeing how consistent those things are with uh, processes like disc degeneration. So in your in your paper, you showed in your presentation, you showed a picture of a cross section of a disc and yeah. on the uh, in cavity, um, there's not really much nucleus, right? And the nucleus ran over to the convexity. Yeah. And it's on the concavity where you're seeing those degenerative changes, right? Yeah. It, it, it struck me that when we're doing a tether to correct the scoliosis, we're applying tension where there is extra nucleus and the disc is quite thick. And so instead of creating a deformity from a fairly symmetrical disc, the goal is to create a fairly symmetrical disc from a deformed disc. So do you think that the same mechanisms are at play when you're applying tension to across a segment with a relatively thick disc? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So stay tuned, I guess, is what I'll say. So that's our, our next one of our next steps with this model is to reverse the deformity that we've already created. And we've done it in one animal where at least macroscopically and imaging wise, we've shown that we could we could get the spine back to straight. Um, so what we did is we we did everything we talked about. We put the, te the implant in, we uh, imparted some tension. We saw a curve develop with time. Then we, re we released that um, flexible cable and waited for a little bit, saw that the deformity was still persistent. It wasn't just something that was dependent on having that titanium cable there. And then went back in and put a uh, titanium cable on the other side and saw a gradual correction with time. So we, we show with imaging, the spine gets straight. And what we don't have yet is the histology and um, sort of the disc level um, high level MRI scans to look at exactly what changes are happening in that disc. Is it the same process that in reverse or um, is something better and healthier happening where we're not creating a, a, a degenerative dying disc uh, by imparting tension to it? Glass yeah. half full. Yeah. So, but you're right. That, that nucleus it, uh, so shift question, it was a big one so, because Peter Newton had done previous work um, with goats and calves, like cows, um, and showed that the nucleus actually went towards the concavity, which he couldn't explain. You know, he didn't have a great thought for. And so we, ours showed the opposite. The nucleus went towards the convexity. And then uh, maybe the, the, other, the other question I had was about uh, the, uh, the growth plate. You know, and pigs have an epiphysis and we don't. Um, and so what, uh, what can you teach us about, uh, the differences in how the disc is, uh, gets its nutrition in a, in a pig model versus a human and how relevant might that be to translating this to humans? Yeah. So, uh, great questions. Um, so the nutrition transport across the end plate should be the same for both a pig and a human disc. It, they both have an end plate. Uh, it's just that the humans, the, the growth plate is an apophysis at the end of the vertebrae. And in pigs, there's an epiphysis uh, and, a, and a physis. So, and actually humans are the only uh, animal that has an apophysis in their vertebrae. So there's not like another animal we could choose that looks more like a human. Um, and in some ways, experimentally, it's probably good to have the end plate and the physis as separate structures so we can see what changes are happening where and where we can target our you know, future analyses and eventually maybe even target our uh, therapeutic uh, attempts. Um, so uh, so some of the other uh, things we have in the works right now is looking um, histologically at the growth plate, measuring the heights of various zones in the, in the growth plate. It seems like the zone of hypertrophy seems to be uh, at least qualitatively uh, when read by our um, uh, veterinary pathologist, the zone of hypertrophy seems to be um, the zone most affected in the growth plate on the concavity. Um, 
and also that's this and on the convexity that seems to be where the splitting seems to be or pulling apart seems to be occurring um in addition to that then we're also seeing the thickening of the end plate and decreased molecular transport across the end plates that we saw on the imaging so there's multiple areas being affected in multiple processes and some of the future work as i said might include immunohistochemistry of those growth plates to see exactly what parts of the growth plates are being affected and at what point in time and to what degree. And Pat, in the future, are there any plans to use this same construct on a large animal model, something that might even be more applicable to humans or even with a large animal model, go back around and give it another go with an anterior approach? Um, all right. Yeah, a lot to unwrap. So I would say if it, I would welcome you to come out to our uh, veterinary hospital and see the pigs and uh, before you, you question whether or not they're large animals. Um, these pigs are really big and uh, they get up to 200 pounds before the end of um, our work with them. And that's bigger than yeah, me. That counts. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, part of, the re- part of the reason we chose them is also they grow very rapidly. Um, so we can see, uh, you know, the changes in, in a short order of time. But, um, yeah, I mean, we, we've talked about, uh, you know, what other animals might be more meaningful. Is there a bipedal animal like a kangaroo, maybe? Um, these are sort of pie in the sky ideas at this point. But um, uh, the, the other thing is that the implant, is, now it, it's time to start thinking about commercialization. So. Uh, the institution owns the, you know, the, the patents might be in our names, but the institution owns that um, intellectual property. So they have to decide how they're going to try to market this or let more science develop around the product, the, the, the implant. It's not a product yet. Um, so who knows? Who knows what's next uh, in terms of the testing uh, for the implant and things like that? We, I have thought that this type of implant might be useful in patients with early onset kyphosis. Uh, particularly when it's not related to a congenital anomaly. So um, potentially I thought about if I had a patient that had that deformity, potentially applying the implant to that um, and uh, applying to the FDA to get a humanitarian device exemption for a one-time use for something like that. And that might be the next phase that we would see something different in this implant. Well, yeah, those are great answers. This is really an incredible abstract. I'm sure the paper is forthcoming. Yeah, or papers. Yeah, there's a lot here. Um, and we're just trying to figure out exactly how to, to get it out there um, in, uh, you know, bite-sized chunks. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. I think we are right up against our time. Um, John, you got anything else you want to take us out? Oh, that's great. Thank you, uh Thanks, Pat, and thanks, Grant, for for an awesome episode of uh, Scoliosis Dialogues. And uh, thanks for our listeners for joining us. And uh, stay tuned for more great podcasts in the future. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. The Scoliosis Research Society is a nonprofit professional organization made up of physicians and allied health personnel. Their primary focus is on providing continuing medical education for healthcare professionals and on funding and supporting research in spinal deformities. Please visit srs.org for further information. 